Dr. Vasu, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. A very good afternoon to everybody. I am delighted today to join you to launch the book, Singapore Aging, Issues and Challenges Ahead, by Dr. Vasu, Professor Bilvia Singh, and Professor Srinivasan. Dr. Vasu has been deeply involved with social issues in Singapore for many decades. He's passionate about social work. He dedicates his time and effort to making a difference on the ground, including as an MP for over 15 years. He and I entered Parliament in the same year, 1984. And even after retiring as an MP, he has remained actively involved in the community in so many ways. Dr. Vasu has also written several books and contributed much to the discourse on social issues in Singapore. I'm very glad that he's teamed up with Professor Bilvia and Professor Srinivasan for his latest project to share their thoughts and insights on this very important topic of aging. Countries all over the world are facing the problem of aging populations, and Singapore is one of them. In fact, we have one of the world's lowest fertility rates, and at the same time, one of the world's longest life expectancies. Our population is not just aging, but aging rapidly. In 2010, about one in 10 Singaporeans were aged 65 and above. A decade later, in 2020, it had gone, risen to one in six, from one in 10 to one in six in 10 years. And by 2030, another 10 years later, it will be almost one in four Singaporeans over 65. And this is a massive change for our society. We see it in our daily lives, at our workplaces and communities. We interact with many more seniors today. Our built environment looks different too, having evolved to adapt to the needs of seniors. So, for example, you see more active aging centers in the HDB void decks, more senior-friendly exercise machines in fitness corners, and also increased barrier-free access across our neighborhoods, lifts on every floor in nearly all HDB blocks, and safety grab bars installed in bathrooms and toilets. But the impact goes far beyond that. An aging population will totally change the way our society works, from our economy to our healthcare system to planning for retirement adequacy. It will also change how we look after and engage our seniors so that they can remain active and healthy, continue to contribute to society, and live out the full span of their lives with purpose and dignity. It is not so straightforward to address the challenges of an aging population. For example, in, the, in European countries, in the EU, on average, more than one quarter of the population are pensioners, and they are mostly receiving state pensions, and the states spend, on average, 13% of their GDP on old age pensions. You think about that. Our entire government spending is about 17% of GDP in Singapore. Without far-reaching reforms, pension spending will continue to rise in Europe as their population ages. But implementing such reforms is very hard. The French government, specifically President Macron, is raising their pension age in France from 62 to 64. But this has led to huge resistance and even civil unrest. That's in Europe. Japan's population is not just aging, but also shrinking. And beyond rising healthcare spending, this has resulted in the depopulation of rural areas and many empty, abandoned villages. Some of them will offer you empty houses for free. You just have to go and live there and be prepared to pay the property tax. But the house is free. And some Singaporeans take them up as holiday houses. China is also anxious about this problem. In 2020, 
Over 260 million Chinese, more than a quarter billion people, were 60 and above. 60 because that's their current retirement age for men. For women, it's even lower. And by 2040, this is expected to rise to 400 million seniors. So the Chinese government, too, are looking very hard at this issue. In their book, Vasu and Bilvia present one possible scenario reflecting the grim reality of an aging population. Escalating health care costs burdening the economy, societal fractures from competing needs across different age demographic groups. But in Singapore, we are determined not to go in this direction. However, avoiding it will take a whole of society effort and everyone having the right mindset. Individuals must embrace aging positively. You can't help your hair growing grayer or sparser, but you can stay open to change. You can keep learning and remaining productive for as long as you can. At home, families need to connect and engage with seniors and encourage them throughout their aging journey. And at the workplace too, Employers need to support older workers and tap on their experience and the value they bring. As a society, we must strengthen the culture of respect towards our seniors, show that we understand and value one another, and avoid thinking in stereotypes that are hurtful and self-limiting. Many of those in their 70s and beyond are still physically and mentally robust, they are an important asset to both the workplace and society. Some are still writing books, like Dr. Basu, and many others too, including the former MPs, whom I'm very happy to see here with us this afternoon, remain active in business, in their professional careers, in community work, keeping in touch with things and contributing to our society. The government will take the lead to push things in the right direction. And let me briefly highlight three key areas. First, raising the retirement and re-employment ages in step with demographic changes. Many older Singaporeans want to keep active and continue working and contributing. Last July, we raised the retirement age to 63 and the re-employment age to 68. By 2030, we will increase them further, 65 to retire, re-employment until 70. And this will assure people that they can continue working in their golden years so long as they are able and keen to do so. Secondly, ret re ensuring retirement adequacy. We've been regularly updating our CPF scheme so that they remain fit for purpose, in line with rising life expectancy and changing needs. For example, in 2009, we introduced CPF Life to provide members with the assurance of a monthly income for life. And the scheme is now operating and people are starting to receive CPF Life payments. This year, we announced changes to raise the CPF monthly salary ceiling for all members and the CPF contribution rates for older workers. We also complement the CPF with schemes like Workfare to provide additional and targeted assistance for lower wage workers, and Silver Support, which provides cash payouts to seniors who had low or no incomes during their working years. Thirdly, we are strengthening our healthcare system to meet increasing demand from an aging population. With Healthier SG, we are shifting decisively towards preventive care to reduce the disease burden for Singaporeans. If Singaporeans can stay healthier for longer, it will help to lighten the load on our healthcare system. Meanwhile, we continue to invest heavily in building new healthcare infrastructure and upgrading existing ones, hospitals, community hospitals, senior care facilities, to ensure high quality yet affordable care for all, especially our seniors. We are also expanding the range of social and long-term care services in the community, as Vasu stressed just now, 
to meet our seniors' desires to age in place. For example, setting up more active ageing centres to provide a wider range of activities to keep our seniors healthy and engaged. All these require significant resources, and we have taken steps, including difficult but necessary moves, like raising the goods and services tax, in order to fund the increased spending to meet the needs of an ageing population. In other words, the needs of you and me, all of us. If we can do all these things right, if all of us, individuals, families, employers, society and the government, can come together with the right mindsets and strategies to tackle ageing in our society, and if we can follow this through and come up with policies, implement them, make things happen on the ground, then we stand a good chance of realising the alternative scenario also presented in the book, where seniors are healthy, savvy, actively engaged in productive and meaningful activities, well respected, and society benefits from their collective wisdom and experience. So I hope this book will stimulate more constructive conversations around ageing. It's important that we continue to discuss and debate such important issues in society to provide fresh perspectives, to improve our solutions, and to make a difference to hundreds of thousands of senior Singaporeans who will one day include all of us. So let me once again congratulate the authors and contributors on the successful launch of the new book. May it sell well and may it have an impact on policy in Singapore. Thank you very much.